this episode, we take our first look into chapter one of the greatest book in the Bible on New Testament salvation. How does a man of God react when his enemies are intent on contradicting his calling, attacking his authority, and mutilating his message? At Paul's first opportunity to preach in a Galatian synagogue, both Jews and Gentile proselytes were present. But it was some of the Jews who were first to leave the building. Sometimes the first ones out the door after the preaching can't wait to get away and hear anything other than what they have been hearing for the last hour and a half. According to Dr. Luke, Paul's message had been real interesting. And you can see for yourself in Acts chapter 13, verses 15 to 41. Those Jews who left the synagogue quickly, might not have known how excited the other Jews and Gentiles were about Paul's message, nor how many people they were inviting to come and hear Paul on the next Sabbath day. Boy, were they in for a surprise. When those Jews arrived at their sleepy little synagogue the next Sabbath day, the Bible says nearly the whole city was there to hear the word of God. And that is when the opposed Jews really began to react. They contradicted what Paul said, and then they blasphemed the Lord himself. As we saw in our introduction to the book of Galatians in our last video, that was only the start. They kept up that resistance until they stoned Paul and left him for dead. And they did not stop their devilment after they learned that he was still alive. The fact that Paul passed through some of the cities of Galatia four times in three journeys demonstrates to you and me his concern for them. As it turns out, Paul's concern was well-founded. When you see a mother come out to the front gate to bring back her little boy who's been bitten by a dog. She pulls him inside of the gate and she consoles him and tells him that it's going to be okay. The little boy is crying. He's scared. He's wounded. He's hurt a little bit. And she turns away from her child just a moment to scold that dog that bit her child. You know, Paul was much like a mother to the Galatian believers. In fact, he said there that he travailed in birth that Christ may be formed in them. You think about a mother, how her words of comfort are spoken to her child and how words of condemnation are spoken to that dog. That's a little bit how Paul was with this situation in Galatia. His concern was well-founded. After he left, his enemies came in to contradict his calling, to attack his authority, and to mutilate his message. Make no mistake, Paul's calling and authority were yielded to the Lord who enabled him and to the gospel which he was to proclaim. As we shall see, Paul's calling and apostleship were not matters of boastfulness, but fulfillment of the will of God. Let's pick up our reading at Galatians 1.1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Every word of this epistle is rich with meaning. Every word is effectively focused on defeating the lies of the enemy and forever establishing the truth of the gospel. One would be hard-pressed to find another written document on earth anywhere as important, as profound, and as powerful as Paul's epistle to the Galatians. I do not presume to suppose that my efforts to teach this great book will ever be equal to what could or should be said. And so I will just tell you 
that every word of this epistle is perfect and pure and deserves much study. Galatians 1.1 Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. No doubt Paul's enemies thought his apostleship was an easy target. I can imagine their arguments and their words. You better watch out for this character, Paul. We know that Christ himself called the twelve apostles, but this fellow Paul came along much later. We have actually spent more time with the twelve apostles than Paul has. We work the same kind of miracles as the twelve. And did you know that Paul didn't even meet Christ here on the earth? Not only that, but his conversion to Christ is questionable by eyewitnesses of his supposed experience on the Damascus Road are unclear and do not confirm that there actually was a voice from heaven. And furthermore, we find it highly improbable that he had a genuine call to be an apostle. But I'll tell you what warms my heart when I think about Paul in that kind of situation. My heart is warmed to know that the Lord himself did not abandon Paul, nor leave him to exert his best efforts to defend himself against his enemies. Now be sure you catch this. The Lord himself came to Paul's defense, for it is the Holy Spirit who gave Paul the very words to write in this epistle. The Lord defends his apostle. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And so here we read the very words of God. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. With express and incontestable words, the Lord repays the foolish lies of Paul's enemies. The best that Paul's enemies could claim for themselves was that they were of men or called by man. But the Lord, through Paul, said that Paul was an apostle by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Repeatedly throughout the New Testament, the Lord upholds his man, his apostle. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. And so I challenge you today to search the Holy Scriptures to see how many times God affirmed the calling and the apostleship of his servant Paul. When I was a young man in the ministry, I did not understand why Paul magnified his office. Romans chapter 11, verse number 13, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. I thought that Paul was boastful. I did not understand that he was a chosen vessel by God to declare the gospel of grace. Acts chapter 9, verse number 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Truly, it was this book of Galatians which helped me to see Paul's unique gospel, his calling, and his unique apostleship. It is my prayer that we all will have a better understanding of those things in this study. The last part of verse number one says, And God the Father who raised him from the dead. At first, that last clause may look non-essential, but there is a great reason for it being there. In Galatia, just as in Corinth, there were those who minimized the resurrection of Jesus Christ and some who denied it outright. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, 
How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 17. Obviously, an attack on the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an attack on the gospel as well. Paul's gospel affirms that Christ rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And Romans chapter 4 and verse number 25 said that he was raised for our justification. Paul wrote the following to Timothy. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. 2 Timothy 2.8 Indeed, Paul was saved and called to be an apostle by a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 2 And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Paul was not alone in his belief of the gospel of Christ, nor was he some oddball renegade who had gone mad with much learning. He was an apostle by Jesus Christ and by God the Father, and who was led quite often to name those believers who stood with him as ministers of the truth of God. Verse 3 through 5. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Grace be to you and peace. These words are combined with Paul's greeting and express not only a desire for his readers to have the greatest blessings of God, but a reminder that there is no real and lasting peace in this world apart from first knowing the grace of God that brings salvation. Amen. Now, verse number four has been near and dear to my heart for many years, and it puts the emphasis exactly where it belongs. I will speak frankly. Christianity has been leavened with philosophy tradition, and extra-biblical ear-tickling bits of damnation. Notice in verse number four, who is the giver and what is the gift? Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world? Our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself. He gave himself for our sins. The popular pulpit philosophy says, give your heart to Jesus. Hey, that's backwards. Paul did not say, our Lord Jesus Christ who received our works for our sins. He did not say, our Lord Jesus Christ who received our clean living for our sins. He did not say, our Lord Jesus Christ who receives our heart. He did not say our Lord Jesus Christ who received our complete repentance for our sins. I tell you that in this world there is no collection of gold, no wealth of silver, no ownership of banks, nor real estate, nor kingdoms, nor power over the nations, nor good deeds that can ever pay for our sins, or even for a single sin. Himself, Himself, He gave Himself for our sins. 
A wise man said, These words are like so many thunderclaps of protest from heaven against every kind and type of self-merit. Amen. And so they are. The troublemakers in Galatia bore a grudge against Paul because his gospel condemned the religious wisdom of the world. Not much has changed today. Remorse for sins is no substitute for the gift of Jesus Christ who gave himself and shed his blood for our sins. Confession of sins is no substitute for the gift of Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us. He shed his blood and was set forth as a propitiation through faith in his blood. All glory to the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. And why? That he might deliver us from this present evil world. One of the prime marks of a cult is when they teach that there is no future rapture of the church and that God's plan for mankind is to live eternally on this earth. That is exactly not the plan of God. God told us what his plans are. First, he will deliver the saved from this present evil world. Secondly, he's going to burn up this world with all of its works. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Watch it. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. My dear listening friend, I hope that you have acknowledged your own contribution to this sinful world and recognize yourself as a sinner. If you do not recognize yourself as a sinner before God and understand the enormity of your sin, then read this Bible and learn the real situation that you are in. Some in this world have a conscience that's troubled by sin. If that is you, then it stands to reason, doesn't it, that if Christ gave himself for your sins, then nothing less will avail to forgive your sins and clear your guilty conscience before God? And still others have violated their conscience so many times that they rarely feel guilt. And they find ways to excuse their sin to themselves and to others. And my friend, if that is your description, you also need to read the scripture and get a proper view of your standing before our holy God. Come to know the one who gave himself for you. Come to understand how you can be delivered from this present evil world. Come to know the grace of God and the peace of God, my dear friend. I am here for you, and please do call on me if I can ever be a help to you. Thank you for watching. I'll talk with you again next time right here on Bible Believers Video. If you have already subscribed and follow the Bible Believers video channel, please do recommend us to some friends that you know who might want to follow along with this study. It is my plan to release one video every Thursday in this study. God bless and have a great day.